we will continue with the topic of uh, chromatography. Chromatography is the most important technique for separation as well as purification. We can use it for small molecules, metabolites or we can use it for large biomolecules even enzymes and proteins. That is why chromatography is extremely important and we are going to spend lot of time on this chromatography. And we will also review some of these uh, fundamental principles several times. So, we use chromatography for separation, purification, even for identification of compounds. We can use say the high performance chromatography for identifying some uh, unknown uh, metabolites. So, chromatographies are used in uh, biopharmaceuticals or in medicine chemist chemistry for uh, separating proteins separation of nucleic acids, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, small molecules and so on actually. So, what does it do? Basically a solute gets distributed in the continuous phase as well as in the stationary phase that is what happens actually. So, this distribution happens because of so many factors either it is partition, whether it is because of ionic forces, whether it is because of hydrophobic forces. Um, or certain types of uh, ligands selectively bind certain proteins. So, so many different forces may be leading to a separation of a solute from the continuous phase. So, what happens? Um, the various components or various mixture, mixture of proteins get separated because of these different forces. So, you have a solid phase or it is called a immobilized phase or it is called a stationary phase. Then we have a liquid phase or a mobile phase um, it is a eluent and the carrier gas or a fluid both can be there. So, if it is a gas then we call it a gas uh, chromatography, if it is a liquid we call it a liquid chromatography. So, what happens this uh, picture tells you pictorially what is happening. So, we have a packed column and then um, we have a continuous solvent flowing through. You have a mixture of material that needs to be separated which is fed from one end. So, it could be a protein mixture. So, like you may having having square protein, circular proteins and triangular proteins at time equal to 0 you are injecting this uh, particular mixture. As it travels through the column slowly separations start happening and uh, when the things exit at the column you will have a very good separation. For example, the triangular proteins may be coming out first followed by the circular proteins and followed by the square proteins at a very large time. So, this is called the retention time, elution time, elution volume and so on. So, different names are there. Now, of course, uh, you are not going to get a beautiful separation as shown here and uh, if you take a, a real life sample there could be several proteins, several tens of proteins, several hundreds of proteins. So, the separation of each protein might not be distinct and uh, uh, separate they may be sometimes overlapping. So, you may have to improve on the <coughs> solvent so that you are able to get a good separation. So, what are the physical principles? If it is based on volatility then you have something called a gas liquid chromatography or GLC. So, if it is based on partition coefficient <coughs> that means, the solute partitions between the liquid in the continuous phase and the liquid that is immobilized then we call it liquid liquid chromatography. If it is again based on partition coefficient you may have a liquid solid chromatography. So, the forces um, of the on the solid could be because of ionic forces or hydrophobic forces or electrostatic forces. Now, if the uh, physical principle is based on charge then we call it ion exchange chromatography. For example, you want to remove salts from a, a protein mixture. I can have a cation or an anion or a combination of both cation anion chromatography which will separate all the salts. So, you will just have proteins. If it is because of hydrophobic forces then we have hydrophobic interaction chromatography or reverse phase chromatography. So, if you have very highly hydrophobic proteins it may get bound to the hydrophobic matrix uh, less hydrophobic or hydrophilic proteins come out. So, that is called hydrophobic interaction chromatography. If it is based on size, the size of the protein or molecular weight of the protein then that is called a gel permeation or size exclusion chromatography. What happens there? Small proteins enter certain uh, void space, they get entrapped, large proteins travel out fast. So, 
bigger ones come out fast, smaller ones come out very very slowly. And then we have molecular recognition. So, you have a ligand which will recognize only a certain protein, ligand will not recognize any other protein, then it is called an affinity chromatography. So, so many different principles you can have different types of chromatography. So, how does a setup look like? You have a solvent which is pumped and then you have an injection port where you are introducing your mixture of proteins or metabolites, then there is a large long column column could be running into hundreds of feet okay. and then uh, there is a separation taking place. Then we have a detector, it could be a UV detector, IR detector, uh, mass spectrometry detector, so many types of detectors, it will detect the various proteins that are coming out. Then we can have a data logging system which will store all the data for further processing. We can even collect each of the sample as it is coming out. And if the sample is pure, we could do several other studies. If it is a metabolite, I could do a mass spectrometer, I could do a NMR, so that I could find out the structure of the molecule. If it is a protein, I could do again a, a mass spectrometry using a MALDI type of instrument or I could sequence the protein to understand the various amino acids present. So, by collecting each of the fraction, I could do several other analysis on this. So, this is how a chromatography setup looks like. So, when the component comes out of the column, there is going to be a detector response. So, it will appear like this. There is an increase in the detector response and then there is a decrease. Now, this time is called the retention time. If it is in terms of volume, this is called the retention volume and generally we assume it this to be a very uniformly uh, distributed normal Gaussian curve, okay. but in reality it does not happen. You may have a slightly distorted curve, you may have a long start or you may have a long tail, but generally we assume it to be a normal Gaussian uniform distribution. So, if you have many proteins or many components, you may have the response like that. So, this uh, one comes out first followed by this one and then finally, followed by this one. So, this particular compound takes much longer time than compound 1 and compound 2. If you look at this um, chromatogram, you see the compound 3 is nicely resolved whereas, compound 1 and compound 2 are not so. So, if I start collecting compound 1, I may be even collecting compound 2 as impurity. If I am collecting compound 2, I may be collecting compound 1 also as an impurity. Whereas, if I am collecting compound 3, it is going to be very, very pure. There is no other impurity. So, so, ideally I would like to separate these two in a similar fashion I had separated on compound 3. So, what are the factors that determine the retention time? the nature of the stationary phase, okay, the type of stationary phase, the porosity, particle size, particle size distribution, type of ions present, hydrophobicity of the surface, so many factors. Composition of the mobile phase, if the mobile phase uh, is hydrophobic, is it a hydrophilic solvent um, and uh, so on actually. Then the column dimension, how long is the column, what is the diameter, what is the number of theoretical plates and then the flow rate of the mobile phase. So, all these factors determine the retention time of your uh, um, sample. For a given stationary phase and mobile phase, the retention time of the solute increases with the increasing length of the column. It is obvious. So, if I have a longer column, it takes much longer time for the sample to come out. Okay? So, this is obvious. The retention time of the solute increases with decreasing flow rate of the mobile phase. So, if the flow rate of the mobile phase is low, obviously it takes much longer time for the solute to come out. So, both uh, these statements are very true and obvious. Now, let us look at uh, or recap some of the equations which I introduced in the previous class. So, the concentration of the solute that is leaving the column is going to be in a form of a Gaussian distribution. Okay? So, the equation for a Gaussian distribution is C equal to C naught 
exponent minus t by t naught minus 1 whole square by 2 sigma square. C naught is the maximum concentration because it is a Gaussian distribution. So, the maximum concentration and t naught is the time at which this concentration happens agreed and t naught into sigma is the standard deviation of the peak and this is a typical equation for a normal distribution. Okay. So, we can take logarithm of this equation you will end up with t by t naught minus 1 whole square is equal to 2 sigma square logarithm of c naught by c. Okay. Just like time that is retention time we can also have an equation for volume v. So, what we say c equal to c naught exponent minus v by v naught minus 1 whole square by 2 sigma square v naught is the volume required to elude the maximum concentration that is at that particular volume you will get the peak max. Okay. And here v naught sigma will be your standard deviation. So, of course, note v equal to q into t q is nothing but your flow rate t is your time v is your volume. So, these two equations we saw last class and uh, they come or they arise because we assume the, um, the chromatogram to be a normal distribution or Gaussian distribution. Now, the amount of i eluted in this time t and t dash will be obvious integral c into q into d t q is your flow rate c is your concentration. So, amount eluted in this time is by this, but the total amount of this particular species in the entire period of time will be from 0 to infinity that is also obvious. Okay. So, the, the, the total amount will be from 0 to infinity amount eluted in this time will be integral of t dash to t. Okay. So, yield will be the amount you collect during this period t dash and t and the total between 0 and infinity. Okay. So, the amount eluted if we substitute for c I will substitute it as c 0 e power minus t by t naught minus 1 square divided by 2 sigma square d t. So, yield will become half into error f this is called an error function error f t by t naught minus 1 by square root of 2 sigma minus error f t dash by t naught minus 1 divided by 2 square root of 2 sigma where error function is defined like this error function x is equal to square root of 2 by pi integral 0 to x e power minus u square by du. So, by calculating the error function and substituting here you will be able to calculate what is the yield. Similarly, we can have an error yield equation for in terms of v also. So, we can put half error f v by v naught minus 1 divided by square root of 2 sigma minus error f v dash by v naught minus 1 divided by square root of 2 sigma. Suppose we start collecting from the time equal to 0 then t dash we will call it as 0. So, that particular term when you put t dash as 0 okay, this particular term will be equal to minus 1. So, yield will become half of 1 plus error f t by t naught minus 1 by divided by square root of 2 sigma. That means, if I am collecting from a time t equal to 0 to a time t and if t naught is the time at which you see the maximum concentration then yield will be given by this particular relation. Okay. Now, any mixture of protein is going to have many components. Okay. So, there is always a purity factor involved in it. So, purity of solute i is given by c naught i yield i divided by various c naught yield j, j could be 1 to n where n could be the number of components present in your protein mixture. Right? So, that is the equation for purity. Then we also have some equations which tell the efficiency of the process or the efficiency of your chromatogram. So, there is a term called number of theoretical plates n, n is given by this particular equation 16 t r divided by 
W B whole square right, n equal to 16 T R dash divided by W B whole square ok. T R dash is your corrected retention time W B is the peak width at the base ok. If I know the peak width I substitute here if I know the corrected retention time I substitute here and I get the number of theoretical plates. So, instead of looking at uh, the peak width I can look at the width at half peak height that is called w half ok. Then I can use that equation and also I can calculate the number of uh, theoretical plates. Now, the plate height can be minimized by reducing particle diameter in the matrix, reducing column diameter in the matrix or changing column temperature, reducing the thickness of the liquid film and also optimizing the flow rate of the mobile phase. So, by doing all this I can reduce the plate height. If I am reducing the plate height that means, I will have more number of plates for a given column length or number of plates for a given column length. Now, any particle which is there present in your stationary phase is going to be covered by a liquid film. Now, this liquid film is going to be dependent upon the physical properties of this continuous phase liquid like viscosity, density, surface tension, dielectric constant so many factors actually. So, this liquid film is going to offer some resistance to the solute that is going to go and attach itself to the stationary phase ok. So, smaller the liquid film um, faster will be the attachment that means, the resistance will be less bigger the liquid film resistance will be more ok. Now, there is another factor which is called the resolution. So, resolution of two chromatographic peaks is a measure of their separation how close those two peaks are how far those two peaks are correct. So, the equation given here is resolution is given by the distance between the two retention times T r 2 minus T r 1 or delta T divided by the width of the peak at the base or conversely the resolution is given by the difference in retention time that is delta T divided by the half height at half maximum that is average of the height at half maximum ok. So, w half average is nothing but the average at half uh, peak height. So, if you look at uh, a two peaks like this you know if they are away at a distance of 6 sigma then uh, the resolution is 1.5. If they are at a distance of 2 sigma then the resolution is 0.5, if they are at a distance of 1 uh, resolution then they are at a distance of 4 sigma, if they are at a distance of 3 sigma then I would say the resolution is at uh, 0.75. So, depending upon the distance between the maximum of these two peaks the resolution also varies starting from even 0.5 going up to 1.5. Now, resolution between peaks improves with the length. So, if I have longer column what I can have better resolution, but then if I am going to have a higher resolution the elution time is also going to increase that means, that peak will take much longer time to come out actually. So, how do you modify the selectivity? we can modify selectivity by changing the composition of the mobile phase, changing the column temperature, changing the stationary phase or even using chemicals we can add some chemicals which will uh, improve the selectivity of certain solute towards the stationary phase. Last time we also looked at something called peak asymmetry because um, although the equations which I have so shown are related to a Gaussian or a normal distribution in reality the peaks are not going to be a normal distributed peaks, it may either have a tailing or it may have a fronting. There is something called a tailing factor which is a plus b by 2 a, where a is the distance from the start to the middle of their peak and b is the distance 
from the middle to the end of the peak. Okay. Generally, you should have between 0 0.9 to 1.1. Okay. Okay, so, if it is 0 0.9, that means you are having fronting. That means, what is it? You are A by B, they are not uniform or A is not same as B, but uh, A is different from B. That is why you are having either uh, the factor 0 0.9 or the factor above 1.1. So, if it is above 1.1, then we can call this as tailing. If it is uh, around 0 0.9 or less, then we can call it as a fronting. That means, in a case of fronting A is larger, B is smaller, in the case of tailing B is uh, larger, A is smaller. Okay. Now, what is column processes and band broadening? So, what happens is when the band keeps traveling inside your uh, chromatogram, it starts becoming broader and broader actually, because uh, the solute is not going to uh, get distributed instantaneously, there is going to be certain time for it to distribute. So, there is a kinetic process, there is a rate process and you need to consider that. Okay. So, these processes needs to be considered when you are giving a finite time for the solute to get itself distributed between the stationary and the um, mobile phase, because the solute um, has to travel in a random path through the mobile phase, then there is a longitudinal diffusion of the solute molecules, then there are resistance to mass transfer between these two phases. So, all these factors come into picture, hence there is a finite time for it to get distributed as well as there is a broadening of the peak as it travels from the um, entrance of the column to the exit of the column. Now, let us look at uh, a, a therapeutic molecule for example, you know a biopharmaceutical or a medicine, uh, we need how do we go about deciding on a chromatography based separation. First of all, you may identify what protein which you want to purify from a mixture of protein. Okay. So, you may be identifying the target gene that is gene responsible for encoding the protein you may isolate the target gene and then this gene may be inserted into a host cell more generally E coli. So, that when it grows it continuously produces the protein product. Okay. So, you decide that I want to make this protein in excess, uh, you identify what gene makes that protein, take that gene put it in E coli that is a host cell. So, when it grows the protein is produced in excess. Generally, we like to have it in extracellular type of situation. We do not want the protein to be produced as a Golgi body or a intracellular material, then um, you have a lot of problems about uh, breaking the cells and extracting your product. So, you would like the protein to be in an extracellular form. Okay. Okay. Then what do you do? You look at the um, how do you manufacture this protein in large quantity. So, you look at the process variables, we look at the pH, temperature, strength, so many factors. So, all these needs to be considered and then you go into the scale up that means, large scale production of the protein. So, how do you go about doing the large scale production? You have to consider the process to be as efficient as it was in the small scale um, so that there are no differences when you scale it up from a lab scale right up to a commercial scale. So, the ionic strength of the mobile phase plays a role in determining the efficiency of binding and elution. We also want to separate the impurities from the target molecule. So, the impurities should be far away from the target molecule and also you need to find out what should be the maximum amount of product that can be loaded before the purity specification is non, no longer met. Then we may have to resort to uh, regeneration of the column. So, when you are scaling up we have to consider several other factors. We have to look at uh, increase chromo chromatographic uh, media volume in proportion to increase in sample volume. So, if I am going to have large sample volume that means, I need to have more uh, chromatographic media volume, but at the same time I need to maintain the sample and the mobile phase composition same. 
then I would like to maintain the same elution time. Just be if I am doing a protein purification in lab and my elution time is 35 minutes, I do not want to be running in hours if I am going to scale up. I want to see whether I can achieve the same elution time that means the same 35 minutes. So, if I am going to increase the media volume how much the elution time going to change. So, I need to consider that aspect also. I want to maintain linear flow rates so that when gradients are accurate, accurately replicated with the increased scale. Okay. So, when I am uh, doing a gradient or a mixture of uh, solvent flow rates in small scale, I want to replicate the same thing in the large scale. So, that there are no discrepancy when I scale it up from small to large scale. Then I need to consider the separation of the target protein from several hundreds of protein. Then I need to consider controlled manufacturing conditions. When I say controlled, we are talking about the ambient conditions, ambient sterility, purity and so, more, so on actually. And then I should be able to do a large scale testing for efficacy as a medicine, because you may make the protein large scale then you may have to test it out in several patients or cases to see whether it works in that particular scale. And then of course, once you are happy with the whole thing you are going into a marketing of a new medicine. So, all these factors need to be considered when you are uh, thinking about a therapeutic protein moving from the lab to the semi technical scale or moving from semi technical to full scale commercial manufacturing scale. So, you see chromatography is highly interdisciplinary subject, we, we need to have expertise of so many uh, different disciplines, microbiology comes in, molecular biology, the chemistry, the bioprocess technology and engineering, chemical engineering principles, biochemistry principles and so on. So, we need to consider all these aspects when uh, you are designing a, a chromatography system for a purification or a separation of a protein. We use liquid chromatography for separating target molecules from undesired contaminant or we can use liquid chromatography for analyzing the final product and see whether the requisite purity has been reached with respect to certain regulatory conditions like FDA that is the food and drug administration stipulations. We have the high performance liquid chromatography or high pressure liquid chromatography. Um, it is generally used in laboratory uh, situations for finding out an unknown component or finding out the concentration of the unknown component. So, you can use it for environmental testing, we want to identify a, pe a, a pesticide or a toxin in a sample, a liquid or a gas sample. It can be used in pharmaceutical industry for separation of chiral molecules. It can be used in pharmaceutical industries for identifying um, impurities present. So, HPLC that is the high performance liquid chromatography or high pressure liquid chromatography here has quite a lot of applications. So, some liquid chromatography techniques ion exchange, hydrophobic interaction, gel filtration, affinity and so on we will be spending time on each one of them in more detail. What are the supports the stationary phase is going to have or the fixed phase? Originally they used to have cellulose based media for purification of proteins, later on they moved into carbohydrate based supports because it offered better flow properties, because it can be cleaned properly after repeated use, because you want to re reuse, reuse many, many how thousands of hours. Then as time moved on they went into synthetic polymeric material polystyrenes and different types of polymers, because we can achieve very high flow rate, we can have very, um, good design stability, it is easy to clean and we can achieve very high purity. So, currently only polymeric stationary phases are used. The columns if you look they are designed for high flow rates and, uh, and for atmospheric pressure or very high at very high pressure. Okay. 
types of columns used stainless steel, high density, glass or acrylic components and so on depending upon the system which you are studying and the type of components you are studying. If you take high pressure liquid chromatography or a high performance liquid chromatography, we are talking in terms of hundreds and thousands of uh, psi and the steel columns are generally used. Detectors, they are the most important which detects or a particular metabolite or a protein. So, a large number of detectors are currently available in the market. <coughs> refractive index detector Ri, if there is a change in the refractive index, it, uh, it gives out a signal or a response. Then you have a ultraviolet detector UV, then you have a fluorescent detector. If your molecule is fluorescing, then that is a very good detector. We can have a electrochemical or a radiochemical detector. So, if it is a, a radioactive material, the detector will immediately spot. You can have a near infrared detector, then we can have a mass spectrometry detectors. Mass spectrometry detectors can be used uh, to determine the mass of the component. We can have a nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR, so it can identify the state of the protons or state of the carbons. We can have a light scattering detector. So, what happens here um, and the component flows, the light gets scattered, the light that is going to the receiver is diminished. So, that is a measure of the concentration of the particular component. So, a wide range of detectors can be used depending upon the um, uh, how the solute behaves, whether it has got a fluorescing capacity or whether it has got a, a mass giving out a large mass value or whether it responds at uh, um, ultraviolet range and so on actually. If you go to a gas chromatograph, then again you have several other detectors. We have the flame ionization detectors that is called the FID, we have nitrogen phosphorus detectors, we have electron capture detectors, thermal conductivity detectors. So, if uh, a component flows and it changes or affects the thermal conductivity of your standard or the base material, you will get a response. Flame photometric detector, photo ionization detector, electrolytic conductivity detector, mass spectrometry detector. So, this is like a GCMS, just like liquid chromatograph mass spec, we also have a gas chromatograph mass spec. Flame ionization detectors are widely used, very accurate. Um, so, the component is ionized <coughs> and then uh, that signal is read in form of a current and that is how the flame ionization detector works. So, depending upon the type of molecule you are studying situation, we can have different detectors uh, possible incorporated into your system. So, when you are scaling up proteins, let us go back to proteins again. We want to move from a lab or experimental scale to a large scale production, testing, marketing as I talked some time back. So, we are talking about uh, um, specialized equipment, trained personnel to run this equipment, manufacturing facility, uh, GMP, you must have heard about GMP, good manufacturing practice, GLP, good lab practice and regulation. So, all these points need to be considered. If you are uh, thinking about scale up actually. So, a chromatograph is nothing but a long tube, we have uh, stationary phase particles here. So, a solvent flows in from one end, solvent comes out from the other end, solute is getting carried through the solvent and there is an interaction between the solute and the stationary phase. So, there is a separation of the various components. Okay. So, what are the things happening here? Solute flowing in with the solvent, solute flowing out with the solvent. Solute is coming in because of diffusion, solute is coming out because of diffusion. There is no conversion of the solute, so there are no reactions taking place. So, we can balance all the input flows with all the output flows. So, you can have partial differential equation relating concentration as a function of distance z and also as a function of time. 
because there is going to be a build up of concentration in this particular region delta z. Okay. So, the build up of concentration of a solute in this region will be equal to the solute flowing in through the solvent solute flowing in because of diffusion minus solute flowing out with the solvent minus solute flowing out due to diffusion. So, if you are interested in using a pack bed type of approach then this is how you do the modeling. So, what terms will come flow rates will come into picture diffusion coefficient will come into picture. Okay. Another approach we can think of the whole column into multiple stage. So, there could be n stages each stage is of equal volume v s v s v s. So, if you add up all these that could be the total volume of your pack bed. So, what happens each stage is well mixed like a continuous stirred tank vessel. So, there is a solvent flow and a solute flowing inside at a concentration C of then again there is a solvent flow out there is a solute flowing out at a concentration C 1, but inside things are well mixed we can consider it as a stirred tank uh, vessel and then this material is flowing into the second stage. So, the concentration of the solute uh, entering is C 1 concentration of the solute leaving is C 2 and so on until finally, you will have C n that is the concentration of the solute coming out at the nth stage. So, each stage could be considered as an ideal well mixed uh, situation and there are n stages where things are happening. So, this is a multi stage discrete stage model. So, the previous case I said uh, it is a packed bed model this is called a discrete stage model. So, people have attempted to model the, uh, the, the solute partitioning or solute adsorption from this continuous phase into stationary phase by using either a pack bed model or a multi stage um, ideal model. We will look at uh, these models once again later on in the course of this uh, particular adsorption. Right. Now, a well known chromatography which is practiced by organic chemist for the past uh, 50 60 years is called TLC thin layer chromatography. It is a low cost it treats a minimum sample. So, cleaning up is easy we can use a wide choice of mobile faces it is very flexible easy sample detection we can even load high samples and ease of handling. So, all these are very very advantageous which leads for the use of TLC uh, by all the organic chemists. So, a synthetic organic chemist if he is um, preparing something in his lab immediately he checks uh, whether the product has formed uh, whether intermediates are formed by using a TLC thin layer chromatography. So, what does it do? He has a glass plate and then on top of the glass plate he has coated silica. Okay. Then he puts in his sample mixture he dips it into a solvent this could be a single solvent multiple solvents. So, as the solvent travels upwards it carries some of the components. So, over a period of time the various products are separated out. So, initially you make a spot of your initial mixture and you dip it in the solvent as the solvent rise because of capillary action it separates the various components of your product and you will end up having several spots. So, you could say each one of them is a product. So, you have to play around with the solvent mixture so that you get good separation of the spots this is called thin layer chromatography it is so simple. And if you know a particular product may be formed and if you have authentic sample of that product from some manufacturer what do you do you spot it and see where it comes that can tell you whether one of the product is what the product which you expect to form. So, simple very simple it requires very minimal cost and easy to test it out. So, if you have two or three expected products and you have authentic or pure samples of those two or three you can spot it along a 
along this particular product and see where it goes and stops. Then you can say this is possibly that product, uh, this is possibly the other product and so on actually. So, we use uh, alumina strongest adsorbent followed by charcoal, fluorocyl, magnesium oxide, silica, we can use silica gel which is the least adsorbing in the group. So, different types of uh, uh, coatings can be used. So, if alumina is the adsorbent solvents with the least eluting power are petroleum ether that is hexane, pentane, cyclohexane, carbon tetrachloride, benzene, dichloromethane, chloroform, ether, ethyl acetate, acetone, ethanol, methanol, water and pyridine. So, that is how it goes solvents with the least uh, eluting power. If you use alumina as adsorbent solvent with the greatest eluting power are organic acids. So, most strongly adsorbed are acids and bases while least strongly adsorbed are saturated hydrocarbons, alkyl halides, unsaturated hydrocarbons, alkene halides, aromatic hydrocarbons like aryl halides, polyhalogenated hydrocarbons, ethers, esters, aldehydes, ketones and alcohols. So, the relationship between the distance travelled by the solvent and the solute after they have reached equilibrium is represented as R f value. So, R f is nothing but distance travelled by the solute divided by distance travelled by the solvent friend. Okay. So, by looking at this ratio we can we can tell how fast far the solute will travel with respect to the movement of the solvent. So, different components will have different R f values. Now, let us look at ion exchange chromatography. So, the separation is based on ionic forces could be cationic forces, it could be anionic forces. So, what we have? We have a base inert support nowadays mostly uh, they use synthetic polymers and then we may have a certain set of ions you know. For example, in this particular example they got lot of plus ions. Now, when you feed a mixture of plus and minus what will happen? All the minuses will bind to the pluses and the pluses will go away. So, if there are proteins which has got a positive charge they will not get bound to the support they will travel out. So, proteins with negative charge will be retarded or bound. Later on when I use a buffer I can remove all these negatively charged protein. So, if I have a positively charged protein and negatively charged protein with this type of ion exchange I can remove all the positively charged protein and retain only the negatively charged protein which can be later separated by changing the pH or the buffer. Okay. So, now your ion exchange chromatography is again ready for another batch of positive and negatively charged proteins. So, similarly we can also have negative ions anchored to the support and same thing can be performed. So, you can have positive ions anchored to the support, you can have negative ions anchored to the support. So, either you can have anion exchange chromatography or you can have cation exchange chromatography or you can have both the ions um, anchored to the support. That means, uh, such a chromatography that is a combination of anion and cation exchange chromatography can separate out all the salts from a protein. So, if I have a, a salt uh, precipitation using a salting out method you are going to have salt and proteins. So, what do you do? You pass it through a anion cation exchange chromatography which will have both anions and cations anchored to the support and uh, the salts will be removed and only the pure protein will flow out. So, depending upon the capacity of the chromatography you will stop the process, regenerate the column and again you do it and so on you can do that. So, a combination of anion cation exchange chromatography can help you to separate sodium chloride or any other salt from protein. So, you will get pure protein and, and you can remove all the salt. So, ion exchange 
chromatography it is very good for biomolecules based on the charge. So, on the stationary phase we attach ligands of certain charge. So, biomolecules in the mixture of opposite charge will preferentially attach proteins with the same charge of ligands or uncharged proteins elute out first. So, we can have two types of n exchange chromatography cation and ion nion and you can have cation anion mixed chromatography is also possible. So, for example, immunoglobin G, IgG, bovine serum albumin BSA or separated on a strong anion exchange using a linear salt gradient. So, we can bind enzymes, proteins and ions of interest and allow contaminants to pass through the column. So, whatever you need of interest will be held in the column restol will pass out. This is useful it allows concentration of the compound of interest. So, that means your compound of interest will get concentrated, but it may overload the column also because compound of interest keep on binding uh, to the stationary phase and after some time it will not be able to bind. Another approach is bind the charged contaminants and allow the molecules of interest to pass through. This is a very good technique if the contaminant concentration is very less. So, all the contaminant will be retained inside the column whereas, your product of interest will be leaving the column continuously. So, we can think of both the approaches either bind the um, product of interest in the column thereby uh, getting rid of contaminant initially or bind the contaminant and allow the product of interest to elute out first. So, for an anion exchanger the functional groups used are amino ethyl and quaternary ammonium. For a cation exchanger the functional groups used include carboxymethyl, sulfopropyl and methyl sulfonate. Sulfonic and quaternary ammonium groups form strong while other groups form weak ion exchanges. So, variation of ionization as a function of pH determines the strength of the ion exchanger system. Okay. So, the ionization of ionization as a function of pH tells you the strength of the ion exchanger. It does not tell on the strength of the binding between the protein and the ligand. Okay. It does not tell how strongly the ligand is bound to the protein. It just tells you the strength of the ion exchanger that is all. So, if you have a, um, cellulose or agarose type of medium, if you have diethyl amino ethyl so, we can have positively charged groups present on the column or you can use a carboxymethyl which will have a negative charge uh, or you can use a sulfopropyl which will have a negative charge. If you have a quaternary ammonia ethyl it will have a positive charge. So, you can generate different types of charges on the surface of the protein by using different functional groups uh, nitrogen based uh, functional quaternary groups or uh, O minus carboxy groups. Okay. A good ion exchanger should have capacity of loading of the sample should not change with the change in pH. So, change in pH should not affect the capacity of the loading or due to loss of charge from the ion exchanger. Interaction between ion exchanger and the solute should be based on simple mechanism. It should be easy to scale up because uh, I may be uh, wanting to do ion exchange in a very lab scale setup then I want to scale it up to a very large manufacturing setup. So, it should be easy to scale up. The capacity of ion exchange chromatography depends upon pH, ionic strength of the buffer, nature of the counter ion, flow rate of the solvent, temperature and so on. So, if I increase flow rate it decreases the dynamic capacity of the system. So, you can as I said originally we can have combination of both anions and cations in the stationary phase that way we can just remove all the salts that are present from a protein. So, a protein entering with protein and salt uh, what is leaving will be pure protein no salts. So, that is also a very good system. So, you may have a salting out facility followed by a anion cation exchange combination. Let us look at a next chromatography system this is called hydrophobic interaction chromatography. 
So, we have matrix which have hydrophobic uh, groups present. So, you may have a mixture of proteins with the hydrophobic and uh, hydrophilic. So, what happens? Hydrophobic proteins get attached to hydrophobic matrices whereas, hydrophilic uh, proteins or compounds leave fast. So, from a mixture of hydrophobic and hydrophilic we may have hydrophilic uh, components or proteins coming out fast the hydrophobic proteins or components are retained. Then we can change the salt concentration or we can change the um, add detergent and so on. So, whatever proteins that got uh, uh, attached or bound will get released this is what is the hydrophobic interaction chromatography is uh, all about. Now, we will look at uh, this in more detail in the next class.